um, session two um, of the conference, we're looking at challenge two, which is around what are the everyday practices and portrayals of gambling in social groups. Um, and um, it's really uh, picking up, I think, uh, on, on lived experience of gambling harms. Um, and we've got a really strong theme of that in our whole session. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our keynote speakers. We're delighted to have with us today um, Peter and Steph Shilton um, to speak. Now, Steph and Peter are established as really prominent campaigners in the gambling harm domain, um, and their work is recognised both nationally and internationally. They have a, a huge wealth of experience between them, um, both in public service, healthcare, um, and the sporting industry. And Steph has spent 20 years um, as, a, as a professional NHS manager, and, and she's got really extensive knowledge within the healthcare sector in the UK. And I'm sure Peter doesn't need any introduction. Peter Shilton, OBE, is a former professional footballer who played as goalkeeper and is still the England national team's uh, most capped player. And he also holds two world records, which is so it's fantastic to have you both with us today. Peter has lived with a gambling addiction for his entire adult life. And with the help of Steph, he's managed to stop gambling. And the couple have since been working to raise awareness of gambling harms for addicts and their loved ones. Um, and they've recently published a book about their experience called Saved, Overcoming a 45-Year Gambling Addiction, which tells their story. Um, Steph is also a qualified therapist, and she's actively supporting affected, uh, affected others. So really delighted to have you both here today. Um, Peter's going to speak first, and then we're going to hear from Steph. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, it's a real pleasure to come along today and uh, share some of my uh, thoughts and stories with you. Um, such a great cause, really, you know, to prevent gambling um, harm. And uh, there's more out of it out there than I think people realise. Um, Obviously, I'm going to have to use my glasses because last time I got up to speak was at Westminster and I said to Steph, oh, I don't need any notes. I'll be all right. I do some after dinner speaking. And I think I ran over time a little bit. So I've got my orders today to uh, to read from a few notes. So uh, hope you don't mind. And also, I've got to obviously use my glasses, which is not a good look for a goalkeeper. Rob. For obvious reasons, you would get a few comments, wouldn't you, every time I wear glasses. So, um, first of all, um, yeah, it's eight and a half years ago, with the help of my wife, Steph, obviously, as you heard, I made the best decision to end my gambling addiction of 45 years and beat the bookies, is what Steph said. Beat the bookies. That's, the, that's what we want to do. No more was I going to give my time and money to them. I was going to put an end to the secrecy that ruled my life. And of course, that's the big thing about a gambler. And stop me doing so many other more important things. I kept it a secret because of my famous football profession. But I think gamblers do anyway. They, they don't want people to know only when they win. Um, and because of that, money was always coming in, which fuels gambling. That's what the gamblers want. Football was not only my job, but gave me a release by the way of the physical work I did. And of course, playing. I looked on gambling as a hobby. I did it in my spare time between matches. Eventually, over the years, my gambling quickly turned into addiction. And even more so after I finished my football career, when obviously uh, things changed a little bit. It was not until I stopped did I realise how much I was addicted and reliant on it, which I think obviously addicts realise as soon as they stop. Steph was my rock and made me see the woods from the trees. She was so supportive in my recovery, saying I was ill. I think that's a very important word, because which did help me uh, to come to terms with what I was doing, because guilt is enormous when you actually realise that you are an addict. 
Since I started gambling in, since I started, the gambling industry has changed so much from small independent bookmakers to three big high street firms at the time, it's many years ago, called Coral Labrooks and William Hill. It was a totally different industry at that time. Uh, you went into a shop or placed the bet on the phone, listened to the commentary and had a credit limit at the time. Now th times have changed. Since 2000, 2000, 2005 and the gambling reforms under Tony Blair, the gambling industry has grown so much with the internet producing so many new betting companies and an amazing increase in new gambling products. Every company is making increasingly massive money from the, pro from the uh, pockets of punters and the increasing number of addicts who are said to be the main source of profit. And that's, we found that a big thing that a very small percentage of, of gamblers addicts do produce most of the profits. Why did I make my addiction public? It was when I heard about how many young people had committed suicide. I spoke to uh, the riches at Gambling With Lives and, and got the information from them. The main reason being they had lost everything and never thought they could stop. And I wanted to say to them, look at me, I can stop, even at my age. And with help, you can as well. And I think that was a big message because that was, you know, that I'll never stop. I can't get over this. And you can with help. And there's more and more help out there now coming along. Advertising has gone through the roof, making betting look like fun with youngsters, teenagers, doing it with their friends and having a great time. The truth is they will lose money and many will end up causing problems for themselves and becoming addictive. We see it all the time, how fun it is, let's get out, let's have a drink, let's watch gambling. It's not fun, we know that. Um, Steph and myself aren't against gambling, of course, and uh, many people will have a flutter within their means. This has been going on for hundreds of years, but to millions around the world, it is a big problem for themselves and people around them. In my gambling days, horse racing was the number one betting product. Now it has changed to football. Hunters being able to bet on anything going on in the match. First corner, first throw in, uh, you name it, first tackle. Uh, I heard a story when certain not to be named football in a match uh, took the kick off and kicked it straight into touch because he'd had a bet on who was the first team to put it into touch. So that's the sort of thing that can happen. And uh, and to be fair, I don't think if you are gambling on football, it takes the enjoyment out of the game. I spoke to many people, oh yeah, it does take the enjoyment. I can't even watch the game properly. So that, that's the side effects. Football has been unhealthy relation, has had an unhealthy relationship with gambling with so much advertising at grounds and on match day TV. Football is a family sport, and that's why gambling companies target it. They're not going to spend all that money on advertising if they're not going to get anything back from it. So it's obvious, uh, as I think this project has shown, the amount of advertising there is. Football has a duty to protect people and youngsters from being bombarded with advertising uh, of matches. Steph and myself have campaigned to get advertising off the front of shirts, and we were delighted when the Premier League decided to do this on the start of next season. Brilliant, we thought. We got really excited. Unfortunately, they said it could still go on sleeves and on the back of shirts, which kind of defeated the object, really. Um, not only that, they said that ground advertising around pitches will continue to go on uh, against defeating the object again. Uh, it seems ridiculous. Um, all gambling advertising in football grounds and on TV when games are being shown should be banned. 
That's my opinion. That way, football can protect the young generation of the potent next potential gambler. And of course, other ones as well, a bit older. Prevention is better than the cure. Of course, there is a great work being done uh, by Epic and Gordon Moody, to name two, for people addicted with gambling and also people around the addict, which is fantastic because it is well needed. Um, parents, whoever it is, sometimes people don't realise what they bear in terms of helping people out and can't, not being able to cope with the, the, the problems that they're causing. Um, the government has highlighted the need to help the NHS trying to stop smoking. And I would also add gambling to that. As we know, it can seriously affect your mental health. And also, people around the addict could be added and end up in the lap of the NHS in many different ways, through worry, heart attacks, you name it. Um, the NHS, will, will, as we know, will bear the brunt of that. Um, this is why studies like this uh, on advertising is vital to show a black and white uh, the enormity of the gambling adverts in football. The white paper cannot ignore these figures, which I think is fantastic. I think it was 11,000 ads in the first week of the football season. And need to change gambling advertising for good. I'd just like to say, well done to everyone who contributed to this work. And personally, I know me and Steph, but I'm sure everybody in this room hopes that it brings change. Thank you very much. I'm going to say, I've written my speech out because it's in such an important speech that I don't want to miss anything. So it, it's the same with me. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you all. And as many of you know, my husband and I have strived to raise awareness and reach out to those that need help. For my part of this, I try to reach out to the loved ones around a gambler because I am proof that loved ones can be the antidote. We can be the success to a full recovery. I'm so excited and I'm honoured to now be working with my new employer, Gordon Moosey. I've got to say that because my clinical director is here today. We deliver an amazing service for the severe ends of treatment of that gambling harm. And I'm thrilled to be working with such a committed team in developing an affected other service. When initiating the service, my employers agreed that despite my experience and knowledge, I could do some research and some studying because we felt that was required to ensure that we deliver an accurate and successful service. I note that I read Taylor and Francis published a report in 2021, and they only found globally 53 studies in gambling harm which affected loved ones. And it states services should be equipped to respond appropriately to the needs of those affected by gambling harms. As a loved one, we often are just as affected by gambling harms as the gambler is. And at a webinar I attended recently, a couple of weeks ago, with Affinet, I was shocked to hear that in a recent study, they found loved ones actually suffered more health problems than that of the gambler long term. The road to recovery is a long one and the financial harms can last for years. The gambling harms for a loved one will sadly often find them in the biggest and most traumatic crises of their lives. Having spoken to many families over the last few years, I can honestly say I have witnessed some awful trauma. Yet many endure this with absolutely no support. They remain the silent victims. Whilst the gambler receives treatment and recovers 
loved ones are then expected to continue to support them in their recovery. And this reduces a loved one's quality of life and well-being. In 2022, the National Australian Prevalence Study identified 25 individual harms alone that loved ones could endure. The YouGov study stated that 7% of the UK population stated that they were negatively impacted by someone else's gambling. It is well documented that affected others' well-being can be affected long after gambling behaviours have ceased. And research helps us understand the range of intensity of harms experienced and the different ranges of their journey to help inform and design and roll out an effective service. And sadly, from my personal study, all reports concluded that far more research is needed and there are gaps in knowledge and, found, and that around affected others. Without such studies for all of us and research, we have no basis. Research is imperative for our foundations in building all of our services. And without studies, research and experience, none of us can become experts in our services. We don't have the knowledge without that fundamental foundation. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to use this platform today to make, take a few minutes to pay tribute to my husband. I wish to say from my bottom of my heart, how proud I am of you. I know the mountain you climbed in your recovery, and I saw what the gambling harm was doing to you. We climbed that mountain hand in hand, alone, together. You then decided to speak publicly and raise awareness as you were disturbed at discovering the suicides occurring, da occurring daily in the UK because of gambling harm. And I know what that took for you to go on Good Morning Britain but you wanted me there to hold your hand. It was so brave and I was so proud because I know that you're a proud man and you let your secret out, which you had hidden for nearly 50 years. It was not easy. And we thought that that would just be it, would come out, raise some awareness. We were honest, we spoke from our heart, we spoke in our own words, but how wrong we were. Oh my God, what a journey we have now come on. We've met some fabulous people that are doing some fabulous work. And so far, we've done around 140 media interviews, documentaries, made films, produced a book. Some were even international and all of which you conducted and never moaned about. You did it voluntarily and in your free time, but always insisting that little old me, the loved one was by your side. You've made stands where others wouldn't dare. You went to Downing Street with a petition to ban gambling advertising on football shirts. You nearly got there. You wrote in the white paper, and you never once have you stopped. You support endlessly in this arena and selflessly. We know that we have changed lives. We know that we have inspired lives. And you know that most of all, you have saved lives. You simply are amazing and I adore you. I'd also like to thank the Bristol Hub for listening to me over the past few years, rambling on about loved ones and affected others. And I'm so truly grateful to Gordon Moody for seeing that vision also. Peter and I also are so pleased and proud to be ambassadors and, oh no, patrons, sorry, of the football studies that have been going on because we must all work collaboratively in supporting, welcoming and endorsing the amazing work that you are doing. 
and we must continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much to Steph and Peter for sharing their story with us today. It's really, I think you'll agree, so powerful. Um, now we're going to have uh, another panel session and Steph and Peter will join us um, at the end of the panel session for, for questions and answers. Um, but I would like to invite up um, our four fantastic uh, panel members. So first of all, we've got Tobias Heyer from the um, University of Bremen. Tobias, have we got our <laughs> Uh, then we have um, Sam Kerwin from the University of Bristol, Liz Riley from Bet No More, and Wendy Knight from the Gambling Lived Experience Network. So we are going to, um, yeah, dig into some of these um, questions around uh, the practices and portrayals of um, gambling in social groups in, 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 in everyday life and pick up some of the themes from the first panel discussion um, with Agnes and the panel members around um, advertising. So our first speaker today is, um, is Tobias Heyer. Um, now, Tobias has a, a very long um, history of research. He studied psychology at the University of Bremen um, for more than two decades. He's been doing research on the topic of gambling. And since 2021, he's been head of the gambling research unit there. And his interests are wide. Um, and they include um, gambling disorder and migration, gambling disorder in senior, uh, older people, online gambling behavior, and so on. Um, Tobias is going to talk to us today um, about, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I've lost my place. Um, Tobias is going to talk to us today about sports betting advertising um, and how sports betting is portray uh, portrayed in the media and what impact specifically that has. I'm going to hand over, uh, Tobias has got some slides as well to the company, um, so I'm going to hand over to Tobias. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Agnes. Um, we're really proud to be here as a German. Um, I think the three Germans are in this room. I'm the only one who's still working in Germany. Um, well, so 20, and, and, and thanks a lot for, for making me old. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm doing gambling research and solely gambling research for 24 years now in Germany. So uh, I can tell a lot about uh, gambling industry and the influence of the gambling industry. But that's another topic. Um, Congratulations for having the, the gambling hub for getting the funding um, and I appreciate the research agenda being interdisciplinary and having that public health perspective. Congratulations on that one. These are two other part of being a member of the advisory board as well. Uh, let me start with a personal story and I have to look at Peter Shilton. Um, Germany, England, that is this rivalry, um, you know, in terms of football. And in former times, it was quite easy. Germany was winning against England, at least after the penalty shootout. Remember the 90s when you were in the goal, Germany was winning. Uh, the times has changed. Uh, and now Germany is not as good anymore, uh, always going out in the, in the pre-rounds pre in the World Championships. So I'm brave to be here as a German talking about sports and sports betting. I consider myself as brave. OK, let's turn to the topic. Pun. Passion, competition, emotion, will, um, cheering, money. These are associations, in my point of view, with sports, with sporting events. But these are also associations with sports betting marketing. If you see the, the adverts, it is exactly what the industry tries to sell. Emotions, will, competitions, but the bad or dark side of gambling, gambling disorder, and all the negative effects are not obviously not presented when marketing uh, sports betting. So to put it in another way, um, is sports betting another form of sport? The answer is obviously no. It's a completely different activity and a risk activity, an activity um, where there is a high addictive potential, at least for some gambling forms. And if you see, and if you do the, the advertising, um, I can 
talk at the end of the day about the, the themes that I'm presenting to advertising, but there's one topic, at least two topics are most important in my point of view. The, the first one is the overemphasis of the skill perspective. You see the gambling and sports betting uh, adverts always, there, there is this, this subtle uh, message, uh, you can make money out of it. If you have the knowledge, if you have the skills, if you just inform yourself about sports betting, uh, about sports and, and so on. And this is exactly what the panel one was talking about that fosters the illusion of control, cognitive bias. When I'm, I'm working with young people, they always say, well, I have the knowledge. I, I have a sure bet. I place my bet on that team and I will make money out. So this is that that cognitive bias, which is a really important point in development and uh, maintenance of problem gambling behavior. Uh, the second one, uh, the second one is, or, or to give you an example of German TV ad, there's a professional and former professional football player. Uh, and there was that, that meaning Hans Sarpai, that is his name, always wins when he plays his bets. He always wins. That was the message of a gambling or sports betting provider. And that is obviously not uh, the truth. Uh, that is not reality. And there's another one uh, by Internet and the slogan, I was, um, I was sitting at my couch with Corona. I was uh, sick and sort of watching television as, as you have done in your research recently at the University of Bristol. And there was that saying, sports betting is our sport. And that is completely wrong. It's a completely wrong message. And I think that should be forbidden, these messages. So the second one, the second one is that uh, the presentation of sports betting is a low risk, uh, risk free activity. There are, there are some signs of gambling can be deleted, but that's it. It's always the positive size, obviously, of sports betting that is presented. Um, when you see the, the adverts, you see cheering people, community, they're setting social norms, the fans that are that are cheering, uh, not cheering because their team is winning, uh, but because they are making money out of their, their bets. And um, there you, you, you set social norms, and it's even more complicated when some former professionals make uh, are celebrities and are the testimonials of sports betting operators. For example, you may know him, Oliver Kahn, the national, former national goalkeeper of, of uh, Germany. Uh, he was a testimonial uh, of Tipico, and the main slogan was, um, your bet is in safe hands, meaning that Tipico is legal, a safe, a good operator. It's also a myth, because legal means not that it has nothing to do with player protection. There can be legal operators, but they don't stick to the rules, Yeah, to be just very clear. Legal good, illegal bad, that is, that is not a true story in my point of view. And um, safe bad means also, yeah, you can make money for sure. This is safe money you can acquire here when you're placing bets with uh, typical. So that is the second theme. And when you see that sports betting um, advertising is embedded in sports, and if you see the, uh, well, remember the association with sports is a health a fostering activity and so on. And these are the attributes which are then um, associated with sports betting as well. Congratulations to the industry. But sports betting is not a sport. So be very clear about that one. And in Germany, we have um, relatively with the rap scene, rap songs are quite popular among certain subgroups. And you cannot imagine how many rap songs, uh, the th themes of rap songs is gambling and sports betting. And then you think about who is in that rap scene, young, male, migration background. And then you have the risk groups of uh, of um, gambling addiction. So that is uh, um, also an issue. And then you have the, the enormous imbalance between the, the uh, money the, the provider put on activities on advertisement, advertisement. And you, in Germany at least, you don't have, have uh, the money for prevention methods. So my, uh, in every, every German um, conference, I always say, take the money the providers um, uh, have for gambling advertising and took that money into to prevention activities, the same amount so that you have the balance between, between both sides. So um, 
Then you have the effects of gambling advertising. Just a short summary of uh, panel one. Um, gambling uh, advertising works for sure. Um, the aim of advertising is just to to attract new customers and to retain uh, frequent and excessive gamblers. It shapes attitudes. Minors are affected by advertising in, in particular, and this is critical for for gambling addicts when they see advertisement. Yeah, yeah they, there's a craving thing, and they want to put. Um, uh, further back. So, um, in my point of view, we have enough arguments to restrict or even ban gambling advertising. Um, we don't need gambling providers always say, but we don't have that study, that longitudinal study, where you can prove that uh, a gambling ex uh, advertisement exposure is a causal risk factor for the maintenance or development of gambling related problems. In my point of view, we don't need this study. It's nice to have. It would be nice to have, but there are enough arguments already to ban or, or to um, restrict gambling advertising. To sum up, in my point of view, sports betting obviously needs the sports. Without sports, no sports betting. But whether sports also needs sports betting and its aggressive marketing, it's, it, is, it, it is at least doubtful from a public health perspective. Thanks a lot. Fantastic start to the panel. Thanks very much, Tim, Tobias. That's great. I'm going to move on now to, um, to our colleague from Bristol, Sam Kerwin. Uh, Dr. Sam Kerwin is a lecturer in the School for Policy Studies, um, and he's also uh, a, 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 a co-lead on one of our challenges um, within the Gambling Harms Hub. Um, Sam's going to take us on to a kind of uh, thinking about new types of gambling, um, and talking about researching the intersections of gambling and crypto assets um, to, to perhaps different groups of, of uh, people um, than previously. So thanks very much, Sam. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for attending. Thank you, Sharon, Agnes, and everyone for organising. Thank you, Sam. Really moving um, keynotes. Just to say, actually, my background is in doing research um, with and on the debt advice sector, and I've long been, um, you know, really interested and invested in how gambling harms are dealt with within the debt advice sector. And that's something I'd be really happy to talk to anyone about. But as Sharon has said, actually, what I'm going to talk about here is this intersection, um, well, something slightly different, really, the intersection of gambling and trading in crypto assets. I've got a slightly, so it's a slightly unusual title. Um, which is I'm actually doing this project with um, colleagues who are, who are in um, mathematics and engineering and um, who have a much more quantitative approach and that focus on, I can't actually see it, but uh, the focus on transients was um, they're seeking to, to use some of the quantitative data we have to build a model um, of gambling practices. And my, and my mathematical colleague was saying it's very important that you think of the future in terms of a kind of transients and potentiality. And we were thinking about the... Um, resonance with gambling as a practice but just say a bit more about hope like one of the things that, that i'm interested in 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 this study in the qualitative study um you know with kind of people engaged in consumer crypto trading is are the forms of hope that they that draw them into that sector in, in the first place and then shape their their trajectory in um crypto trading um the context for something um, the context for this, this um, study, um, as you may know, is that in May, I put a mistake here, it should say Treasury Committee, not, not Select Committee. Um, but there was a recommendation from a Treasury Committee that, that trading in, and I'll use the quotes, consumer trading in unbacked crypto um, to be regulated as, as gambling. Um, unbacked, obviously, being a key term here that the proposition being that we're talking about zero sum uh you know investments where, where you are risking all of your all of your investments and, and therefore is, is closer to gambling than regular financial um practice and financial investment so that 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 recommendation has has proved to be a, a, a context for for this study what i'd like and and, and the treasury committee heard um you know the evidence on the significant harms in in this area the kind of continuity between this study and other things we've we've heard about is that as you will know there's a there's a real continuity between um 
gambling advertising and crypto advertising in sports, uh, particularly particularly in football and and online. You know the of um, crypto asset trading platforms on in those spaces, well, it's extremely prevalent. Um, and the, the committee itself heard, you know, the significant evidence of harms in this area of people losing, you know, savings, um, and of the kind of addictive patterns into which people are drawn in in crypto asset trading. I'm, um, what's what I'd like to. What I'm interested in, in in the qualitative projects, I've been running interviews and I'm still doing interviews with people engaged in this kind of, of trading, thinking about what are the tensions going to be in regulating this area if it is regulated under the, the ambit of gambling regulation. What might some of the tensions in that regulation be and what kind of regulations should we be looking for if we want to minimize harm in this area? So. I've got my statement about the project is funded by um, Bristol Hub for the Gambling Harms. Um, I'm actually working on this project and a project that we're going to be talking about in the afternoon as well on, on betting shops. Two things I'd raise. First, first of all, that you see very prominently the, the, the similarity with gambling practices, particularly you know, in, in terms of the addictive nature of, of how the platforms are experienced and, and sold, um, how people are drawn into them in, in periods of intense activity. And certainly all of my participants em emphasized very heavily the need for much greater education, particularly for young people, of the types of risks that they are in, you know, the types of risks that they are taking on when engaging in, in crypto trading. But the, 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 the other point I would raise is that several of the participants were at the same time, you know, quite, yeah, uh, were were kind of slightly antagonistic when it came to the proposition of, of bringing this under gambling regulation. For the reason that they saw that as a way of taking, you know, of, of denigrating it or taking away the specific forms of, of financial practice that they saw um, crypto investment to be. And I think one of the things as we move forward in thinking about how to regulate this with the recognition that it does need to be regulated with the significant harms um, particularly when people are losing significant amounts of money and being drawn into it under false pretenses, we have to think about actually crypto trading as a specific form of financial practice that is related to gambling, um, but potentially not exactly the same. And this is what I'd really like to, to talk to people about today. My final, my final two um, slides, the other side of our, of our project um, has been looking at uh, quantitative data drawn from a um, decentralized gambling platform um, and thinking about how we can use the available data from um, you know, crypto backed casinos um, to think about modeling gambling patterns and to think about modeling um, intervention into problem gambling and reducing gambling harm. So I've got two slides from this project or two charts. Um, and it's indicative really, these are more descriptive, but what we're seeking to do is to build a model for, for modeling Issues such, such as when might someone return to gambling after a period away and what is it that shapes, you know, um, periods of intense gambling activity as opposed to periods of removal from gambling activity and thinking about how we can use this data to actually enable interventions that will assist people in, in minimizing harms and, and stepping away from gambling. So this is a modeling of, um, I can't actually see, so I don't want to, I don't want to get it wrong, but the, uh, um, when it is that someone uh, has the day of, of heaviest spend, thank you, <laughs> of, of heaviest spend having signed up for the platform. And we can see that for the vast majority of people, it's in the initial, in the initial period. And the second thing we're trying to do is to model um, periods of, of win chasing and loss chasing and thinking about how we can model that to maybe have a preventative model or a predictive model of when someone is going to engage in period of wind chasing or loss chasing. So this is an, these are both ongoing projects, the things we're trying to do, and I'd love to chat about them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sam. I think it picks up on some of the, um, the, the kind of themes that we perhaps have in this um, session around, you know, we're talking about gambling harms, but it's also how people think about it. So there, there might be hope, there might be optimism, there might be feelings of feeling confident and, um, and, and, and kind of encouraged um, that, that things will work out well for you. So I'm going to move now on to, we're going to hear now from um, our colleague, Dr. Liz Riley. 
And Liz is the Head of Research and Evaluation at Bet No More UK. And Bet No More is a charity that supports people who experience gambling harms. Um, and, and Liz what, uh, has um, led several projects um, exploring women's support needs and the effectiveness of peer support groups, I think has been really important in terms of helping our understanding in these areas. And she's um, currently part of a research team led by the University of Durham, um, funded by the Gambling Commission, looking at uh, gambling, gambling related domestic abuse. So another really important topic. So over to you, um, Liz. Thank you, Sharon, and also thank you to the Hub for the opportunity to speak to you all. So I am denied over what to do this, at what women was I going to talk about, whose voices were I, was I going to give some space for, and I decided to, to focus on the wives, the partners, the mothers, grandmothers, daughters, sisters, whose voices don't get a lot of their time, and obviously building on some of the, the things that uh, Steph talked about before. Um, so women affected by somebody else's gambling. Um, and I will use the term affected other just because it's handy, handy um, short term, but I, I recognize that for some women that feels like that, that term marginalizes their experiences. I'm gonna draw upon research that was con or commissioned by the Howard League on women crime and gambling harms and a shout out to Julie who's here, who led that project as well as um, one of our peer researchers, and also drawing upon um, some of the focus groups and interviews that I conduct regularly in, uh, when I'm wearing my, my monitoring and evaluation hat with our service users. Um, so it's going to feel like a bit of a whistle-stop tour through gambling harms for affected others, which in some ways feels wrong to, to treat this so superficially when their experiences can be so um, complex as well as traumatic. But I'm going to focus, first of all, on some of the health harms, especially the physical health harms, which I think don't get quite enough attention as they should. And some of the women that we've spoken to talked about that immediate impact upon their ability to sleep, on their appetite, on their loss of weight, on their um, just that lack of self-care that started to happen, stopping going to the gym, stopping swimming. They didn't have the headspace for that. And then some of them realized as well that they couldn't even afford those memberships anymore. And obviously the mental health and the physical health sides of things, they tie in together and they reinforce each other. So the women talked about firefighting and having no space to process their own emotions, um, of dealing with intense levels of anxiety and stress. Um, and they talked about, they used words such as trauma and shock and devastation, especially when they found out about the gambling harms in a shocking manner through a knock on the door from the police, through um, an official letter through the post, through a confession, or through maybe catching sight of, of a text message on, um, on a mobile phone from a debt collector. And they talked about huge levels of guilt in terms of um, being perhaps bailed out by, by parents um, or not spotting the signs of the gambling harms early enough, not stopping them from happening. And also lots of guilt in relation to, to potential harms for children. Um, some of the women that we spoke to, um, the, the gambling harms had profound impacts on their performance at work. They lost jobs. Some women had to take extra jobs in order to pay off the, the gambling-related debts. Um, there was a case of a daughter who was studying at university. She had to take on extra work in order to send home money to, um, to pay for the, the gambling debts of the parents. Um, and obviously, financial harms for affected others is one of the things that there is more research evidence on. Um, you know, lots of complex debt. Um, sometimes in the name of the women, which they were unaware of. Um, and that brought them into contact with financial institutions who demonstrated little understanding of gambling harms. And the women were having to tell those traumatic stories over and over again. And they were often met with skepticism over whether or not they, they uh, or they weren't believed when they said that they had no idea of the extent of the gambling harms. Women lost houses that we spoke to. And the harms were not just immediate, but as Steph said before, these uh, the financial harms can be long-term. 
maybe a CCJ, which stops you from getting um, rented accommodation years later or accessing financial products as mundane as insurance. Um, and in a focus group, women told me that their entire relationship with money changed. They started to feel guilty if they spent money on themselves. They, um, they started to, they, they had an ingrained habit of saving money just in case the, the, um, the person started gambling again. And obviously many affected others start to take on that extra burden of managing finances and that can shift the relationship um, with the with the other person. I need to start really rattling through this because I've only got two minutes. Um, relationship harms, loss of trust, grief, uh, huge amounts of conflict, arguments, and also an isolation from friends and family um, who perhaps didn't understand the, the gambling harms. Um, shame as well in relation to gambling harms, having to over-explain or justify themselves or being coerced into keeping the, the gambling secret as well. Um, some of the um, harms that resulted from crime were financial and domestic abuse, coercive control, threats, um, and they were not just within relationships or within the family, but perhaps from external sources as well in terms of loan sharks and such like. And then I'm just going to use my last minute or so just reflecting on some of the things that women have told us in terms of their experiences of recovery and support needs. In that initial um, time period, they all said that their focus was very much on the person who was gambling of wanting to find help for that person so that they would stop. And when uh, support agencies offered them support and suggested that they may need support, they were actually quite dismissive, dismissive of that at first. Um, the women as well in those first stages had very little awareness of what gambling harms were. One woman told me that she Googled, is gambling an addiction? Because she needed some way to get hold of what she was facing. Um, support services almost needed to give the women permission to begin to focus back on themselves in time, to rediscover who they were because they had totally lost sight of it. And um, importantly, to really begin to uh, just strategies to rebuild trust with um, within that family domestic setting. Right, my time is up, so I'm going to stop and also apologize for the superficiality of, of, of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. I think that was a really powerful bringing together. I don't think it was you may have needed you know, covered a lot of ground in that, but um, it certainly gave us a, a really great sense of the issues that that women face and and the feelings and emotions that go alongside that. So thank you very much. Um, our, our final speaker, but by no means our, our, our least speaker on the panel today um, for this session is Wendy Knight. Um, we're delighted to have Wendy with us. She's a member of the Gambling Lived Experience Network, um, and. Wendy has a, a long working history as a leader um, in service provision for disadvantaged children and families. Um, and she's been a really um, pivotal um, player in, in the, in the Shorster Children's Centre movement, which is um, fantastic. And she's been heavily involved um, um, in contributing um, around her lived experience of gambling harms on, on women's experience of gambling and crime and lived experience, including contributing to the Howard League for Penal Reform and their commission on crime and gambling related harms. So um, yeah, delighted to have you, Wendy, please uh, yeah, share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Sharon. Can I ask Dr. Riley, um, Dr. Brown and um, Dr. Treblecock to stand up, please. <laughs> These are who I've got to blame for me being sat here today. Um, I went on some um, as a peer researcher, and these ladies really brought me back to life, if you get what I mean, because then, um, you know, um, I lost a lot of self worth and things like that. And they brought me back, and that's why I'm sat here. All right. So, my name is Wendy Knight. I'm a compulsive gambler. 
But I'm also, I can't believe it, head of operations at Blaine, a gambling lived experience network. And what we want to do is amplify the voices of the lived experience. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in um, Parliament speaking to Caroline Harris and Sir Ian Duncan Smith, which I just said, hi, Ian. But, um, you know, you know about the high stakes, the white paper, um, and it was a really interesting conversation. I was very frightened at first, thinking that it was going to be um, a bit more complicated than it was. And it was a conversation that made you feel very much um, at ease. So I just want to share a poem with you just to set the context, because I don't know if the context has been set around what gambling looks like. So this is my, a poem. I'd like to say I wrote it, but I didn't. Um, so it's called I Am Addiction. I am addiction. I started small, subtle ways, promising many things. I promise you enjoyment and pleasure beyond your wildest dreams. I deliver guilt and despair more horrible than your worst nightmare. I promise you power and courage. I give you feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness. I will force you to live in fear always. I promise you relief and escape from all your daily problems. I create for you greater problems than you ever imagined. I promise you many friends. I allow you only isolation. I promise you, I promise happiness. I create much sorrow. I will steal from you your dignity, your families, your friends, your children, your homes, your demons, your spirit, and your life. For love, freedom, freedom and happiness are impossible to find in my presence. So never underestimate me. I am devious and manipulating. I have no preferences as to who I pick as my victim. Rich or poor, young or old, black, white, yellow or red. I have killed men, women and children. I have no conscience. So if you have met me, always be aware. If you think you can beat me, that I will be gone from your life and all will go well again. Never forget that I will always be there, waiting in the dark shadows, just around the corner. I am very patient, and I will laugh in your face if I can lure you into my evil world on, her, on hell on earth once again. But don't let this happen to you, it says at the bottom. So that's a bit of a context of what feels like um, when you're gambling, when you're gambling and you're a gambling addict. And that's how I felt. But... Um, I, I do want to just set out three things that I sort of spoke to the APPG, the, the ministers, about the white paper. And um, I'm, I always are drawn back to Bob Proctor. He says, you cannot join the dots of looking forward. You can only join the dots of looking back. So I look back to my ancestors who came here on um, the Windrush generation um, and my, my presentation is entitled, Not Here for the Weather. They, they came here for the money, obviously, you know. And when they got on those boats, many of them was introduced to gambling for the first time in their lives. Uh, you know, it was very rudimentary gambling under a palm tree with some stones and things like that. But when you got onto the boats and came to England, um, they found gambling, many families, on the boats over here. And when they docked some in Liverpool, they had no money. So they had to set up their families around the ports. And that's why you might find a lot of um, big black communities around the ports. Um, and that, that dates back to when we came here in the Windrush generation. But we know that migration hasn't gone away. People are still coming on boats for the money and for a better life. And it's one of the things that I feel like the white paper does not um, address properly. You know, there are, there are people in our country who have no recourse to public funds and can often turn to crime and gambling to um, sort of support themselves. And I think that needed um, a bit more um, teasing out, OK? Um, for me, I whistle blew on a head teacher who brought a gun to school. And you can tell I'm not from the South. But... <laughs> So in West Yorkshire, um, one of the head teachers brought a gun to school and I whistle blew, thinking that I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I ended up being suspended and I got dismissed from my post um, as head of operations. Yeah. Oh, 
That's a bit of a thing, I know. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I got dismissed. And during during the suspension, I was suspended for a year and I went and I gambled everything. And it was, um, it was I felt traumatized, really, because my career had been long. Um, I'd already gone to Parliament and things like that before, for sure, start and things like that. And um, I was facing the end of my career, really. Um, and I gambled lots. And um, I think trauma is not recognised in the white paper a lot. You know, I'm glad that they've got this, these things around 18 to 24 year old, but there are other transition points, bereavement, menopause. So if I start sweating, so in the middle. Right. So there are other transitional points that are not really recognised and need some support. And it was nice to that Caroline Harris sort of picked it up and said, I want to do some work around, around that. So hopefully we'll, Glenn will be working with um, ministers around some of those transitional points. Um, and the last thing I'd like to talk about is um, land-based provision. You know, the high stakes paper is about online, but you know, it almost feels like, oh, land base is all right. No, you know, in a lot of the disadvantaged ends, you know, where I've been brought up and uh, grown up, uh, disproportionately operators set up in our ends, right? And uh, I'll take you on a trip. Um, but I, I kept on talking to Dr. Treblecock about um, liquid money, which you like, right? But I'll, I just want to explain this to you. Some people call black people's money liquid money. And that's because of um, systemic and infrastructural things. So when I come out of my house and I want to go and get a bottle of milk, and if I wanted to get that bottle of milk from um, a black-led um, organisation, I'd have to drive two miles from my house to put my money into a black-led organisation. And some of this is about structural problems that, that, that um, the black community face. So, and I probably drive a pass about 10 Bookie, bookies and um, gambling operators before I can pour my money into um, maybe Caribbean food shop or something. Yeah, but so there are structural things. And I, and I think that this white paper isn't a panacea for everything, but, um, you know, there, there are some structural things that need to change around land-based provision. Not only are there hotbeds for crime, you know, a lot of our young people, I'm, I'm in the GA, I'm not, no, I'm not, know if I'm supposed to tell anybody, but I'm in Gamblers Anonymous and some of, some of the families come and say, our children have spent three, four thousand pounds on the credit card gaming. Um, and um, um, I say that they're sort of the lucky ones if they find out how much their children have spent on their credit cards, because very often when they're gaming, they can be intercepted by county lines and um, they can buy their debt off them. And then that young person can be running up and down the country carrying drugs to pay off debts from gaming. And I, I want to also impress on you that you need three things to gamble. It's the triangle. So you need time, opportunity, and money. And for our young people, if we can get them to um, game for a long, long period of time, then they can be the next compulsive gamblers who need to gamble for long periods of time for the operators to get the money that they need. Um, and, oh, sorry, and that's it. Sorry, I was going to say that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to our four panellists and I'm going to invite Steph and Peter if you would like to just join us. I think we've got some chairs on the um, end there. Um, we just I'm going to eat into our lunchtime a little bit because we um, um, because we've got such fantastic panel members here. So um, if you've got any questions um, and you'd like to put them on Slido, please do. Um, but also we're going to have a bit of a I'll move up. <laughs> I can always stand on the end. But yeah, if, have we got any questions in the room for uh, um, Steph and Peter or for any of our panel members from their, their brilliant discussion? Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I think this question is specific, specifically for Dr. Sam Kerwin. Um, you touched on one of your slides um, about household financial rhythms and accumulating sufficient capital and linking that back to hope. And I would be really interested in knowing how those household fluctuations do impact um, that specifically maybe in crypto, but also generally in gambling, if you have any information on that, please. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is what, um, you know, I was trying to, this is the focus, I suppose, of, of my interviews is trying to draw those two things together. The thing I raised on the slide was the um, the importance for um, a majority of, of the participants in, in a very long rhythm towards home ownership and the feeling that, you know, in as much as they're all renting, um, that there's no prospect of, of seeing how this current rhythm leads to acquiring enough, you know, um, capital to, to purchase a home. So having the, the, the kind of crypto assets running alongside that at the same time um, is a way of holding on to that, that idea. All of the participants framed actually very, very, their crypto trading very strongly in terms of surplus income. And so, I mean, that might just be my participants. I don't think that's actually a generalized experience that had a very, very strong framing that they picked up from friends and online discussion as well about this is something that your surplus income goes into as opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to um, your your regular regular outgoings and there's going to put into jeopardy being able to pay off, you know, rent. rent. I'd be happy to chat to you more about it because that is my particular area of interest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was a privilege, privilege to share that platform with you, Wendy. And as you've mentioned, the uh, white paper, uh, I don't think it's going to do a great deal to prevent harm. If you've got any uh, uh, concerns, just read the impact statement where it basically says uh, we can't measure it, uh, which equates to me as we don't want to be held accountable for what it will deliver. The things that are missing that should be in it are the strategic level things statutory duty of care on the operators to prevent harm, a ban or strict control on advertising, and a duty on the regulator to uh, prevent harm rather than permit gambling. So that's the end of the advertorial. Question for uh, uh, Peter and uh, Tobias. Uh, front of shirt advertising, I think I saw some research recently which suggested that uh, contributed six or seven percent of the total advertising around the football grounds with uh, with all the, uh, the pitch side advertising, back of shirts and so on. With all that advertising being displayed and in the view of children, should football grounds be an over 18 venue? I don't think you should should stop youngsters going to watch football just because of gambling um, advertising. Uh, I think you're quite right that the front of shirts, I think maybe that's a little bit not quite right. I mean, a lot of kids these days, they get sticker books. Uh, our grandson's got one and, you know, they've got their favourite players of each team and they're looking at these photos and all the time they've got gambling adverts. So it's not just on the pitch, it's it's the other things around that that can if affect others they, they probably at the time don't realize it but they're familiarized themselves with their heroes with a and that a Beckham company's name on it and i think uh I, obviously i'm particular particularly involved with football um because that is the number one betting thing at the moment but i think as i said in my speech the premier league made an made a token effort you know they should have gone all the way and said, get it off all the shirts, get it from round, because you see flashing as the game goes on and the survey has proven, you know, the amount of advertising. And uh, that is their main, they wouldn't spend the money they do if it wasn't effective. That's their main source of getting to the public. So it's got to be curbed. If they want to, it's not rocket science. They want to stop gambling, especially with youngsters. You know, they've got to stop throwing it in their face every few minutes and making that out to be something that's going to solve all their problems. It's fun, you know, let's go and have a big bet. You know, to me, that's wrong. Uh, football grounds be 18 and above only. Uh, I'm not a friend of, of um, I'm not a friend of minor changes. Um, I think to put it in a broader perspective, yeah. 20 years ago, we had that high risk group, um, males, young people, people with migration background. And now the sports betting industry and the market expansion has created a new high risk group, members of sports club, either professional, amateurs, young adults. 
And this is the reason why advertising should not touch these high risk groups. So I don't need advertising at, at all in this uh, uh, setting. So then if we have no advertising, your question is senseless. Right, I'm gonna, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna draw the session to a close because we are running a little bit over time, but I'm sure the panel members will be happy to take questions over, over lunch. Um, and just want to um, let's put our hands together and give a massive round of applause.